Okay, welcome back everyone to our final session of the meeting. So we're going to start with Petsy having gone from rocks in the depths of the earth. Now we are going to Petsy in the ionosphere. And, and leading us there is going to be Matt Young. He's a research scientist at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, microphone. Yeah, and just had a uh, mute. All right. Yeah, good Thank memory. you. Thanks. Please take it away. Uh, can I get a thumbs up from the tab back table? All right, good. We are live. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, Toby, uh, and thanks, everyone. Uh, I, as I, I, I will repeat uh, in the microphone what I've said to a few people uh, the last couple of days, and uh, this is my first non uh, physics focused uh, workshop, and uh, it has probably been my uh, so for my favorite workshop experience, uh, I feel like I've found my people. So, so thanks a lot, uh, everybody, organizers and attendees alike. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, research that I started uh, during my dissertation work at Boston University and that I've recently, uh, after a few year hiatus, uh, uh, returned to with that same group uh, as we work on the next uh, stages uh, of the problem that I was working on uh, for my PhD. Uh, and so to begin, uh, let me give you a little primer on the ionosphere. Uh, the ionosphere is the electrically conducting, uh, partially ionized portion of uh, our upper, of the Earth's upper atmosphere. Ionospheres exist on other planets too, and so Earth is not unique in this way. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be talking uh, today as if uh, it's just about Earth's ionosphere. Uh, and, uh, and so through a number of uh, photochemical processes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, there is a portion of the, uh, uh, the atmosphere that um, becomes ionized. The electrons split off, usually just a single electron splits off from a molecule, and so you get a positive ion and, and an electron. Um, and uh, we, uh, the aeronomy community, over uh, decades and decades have come uh, around to this uh, distinction, this, this stratigraphy that, um, that I'm showing here, uh, the other direction from the, the rocks. Uh, uh, we talk about the ionosphere roughly in terms of the D region up to about 90, maybe, a, yeah, 90 kilometers uh, during the day. Uh, and then the E region, and I'll explain uh, where the, uh, these letters come from in a second. Uh, and then above that, the F region up to a few hundred kilometers, and then these sort of transition out into space, and the plasma becomes, uh, the, the air itself becomes more rarefied, um, it becomes more ionized, there's more, um, yeah, more percentage of it is uh, split into electrons and ions, and then you, you get out into outer space, and I stop caring about it uh, for, for this research, for this project. Um, and so, uh, f as a bit of history uh, and uh, in terminology, the E region got its name first because uh, people uh, with radars um, blasting their radars around uh, wherever they could uh, realized that it supports uh, electrical currents and, and, uh, and would reflect electromagnetic waves, and so they said, well, that's the E region. Uh, and then what comes before E? Well, D does, and then what comes after E? F. So there's where you get the D, E, and F region of the ionosphere. Um, and uh, that's a heavy. Uh, and, uh, and then if we talk in terms of what makes up the, uh, the ions uh, and the, the neutral particles, uh, it's mostly uh, around 90 or 100 kilometers, uh, the base, uh, the, the interface between the D and the E region, uh, it's mostly N2 molecules uh, and NO plus ions. Uh, they're, um, they're also, you can see in the right panel here that um, they're O2 plus ions, but those two basically uh, have the same mass, they're similar enough. So for the sake, for the sake of simulations, uh, I just think of those two as the same thing. Uh, but one thing I want to point out here, uh, which I've included at the bottom of the slide, is that uh, the N2 density is about a million times that of NO plus or uh, O2 plus, um, and so that's going to become really important in terms of the relevant physics. Uh, because uh, if you zoom in on uh, a single ion and its uh, corresponding electron buddy uh, and watch what they're doing. The ions, the big heavy ions that came from uh, uh, N2 uh, or O2 molecules are, um, are running into those other neutral molecules a lot more than they're gyrating about the electric field. Uh, which, uh, and, and that gyration is a standard picture when you talk about plasmas or you know, we talk about uh, E and M charged particle physics in general. And it's still a valid picture to think about, 
but, um, but the ions aren't really accomplishing that. They never get time to do that before they collide with a neutral molecule. The electrons, on the other hand, uh, even though they actually, on average, collide more frequently than the ions, uh, we can talk about this in terms of a collision fr frequency of, of the fluid, uh, when you, if you zoom out from this picture, even though their collision frequency is actually much higher, uh, they're whipping around the magnetic field, uh, and they can undergo plenty of those orbits um, uh, before running into a neutral molecule. And so they're, they're E cross B drifting, if you, those of you who know uh, a little bit about plasma physics, uh, they're, they're spiraling around and in, in the combined uh, electric and magnetic field, they are moving um, perpendicular to both of those, uh, while the ions are just sort of slowly drifting in the direction of the electric field. Uh, the magnetization uh, parameter, which I have here is kappa, uh, kappa S for the species, is an important way to talk about this, to parameterize uh, these, uh, th th this set of um, uh, physical uh, phenomena. And it's the ratio of the uh, species gyro frequency to its collision frequency. And so again, this is a, f a fluidic picture when you're talking about the magnetization in this sense, um, but it's because of, of uh, kinetic processes. Uh, and that leads to a certain collection of instabilities in the E region. Um, these are electrostatic instabilities, so um, the magnetic field isn't changing. Uh, and uh, I, I tend to talk about them in terms of the uh, relative perturbed density, which I have listed there at the top. And so that's the ratio of the, the deviation from the background uh, minus the background, so you get just the deviation about the background normalized to the background. Uh, that's my delta N over N naught. And so if you put yourself uh, in the frame of a little wiggle in the plasma that has arise, uh, arisen for some reason, thermal perturbation or something, uh, you uh, will often see uh, that the electrons are moving just a little bit ahead of uh, that wave. They're on the front of the wave. Those are the minus symbols um, in, in the, um, the wave I've drawn here. Uh, because they're just much more mobile, while the ions are kind of lagging behind. And so in this frame, there's a charge separation between the electrons and the ions uh, that, uh, that creates an electric field in phase with this wave. And so what I have here is uh, if, if I call uh, delta N over N positive to mean where the, there's relatively more density, uh, perturbed density, and then uh, negative where there's relatively less, uh, the a uh, polarization electric field that comes from this charge separation uh, has the same sign, is in phase with it in, in the sense that it's pointing, uh, pointing one, it's, it's positive where delta N over N is positive and negative where delta N over N is negative. Um, in this picture, I, I, let me point out in case uh, I'm waving my hands too much that the magnetic field is out of the, the page uh, in this picture. Okay, so uh, so I flip that wave up, and, and now I'm looking at the, the crests are, um, are bright and the troughs are, are dark here, and I'm sort of looking down on that uh, picture that I had before, and, and it, where the relative perturbed density is high, so is this little polarization electric field, and um, same for the, the low and the negative. Um, the farley booneman instability arises when the electrons are moving fast enough to pull the ions along behind them faster than the pressure that um, comes from the, the plasma clumping up can smooth, uh, can smooth itself out. And so uh, it's that same picture with the electrons moving ahead, but they're moving ahead so fast that the ions can't really relax ever. And so uh, little perturbations grow into instabilities, grow into uh, uh, larger irregularities. Uh, and that's encapsulated by the uh, criterion that I have down there in the lower right corner, that the electron drift speed uh, will be greater than the sound speed, that sort of embodies the pressure element of it, uh, by a factor that's a little more than one. And that sign knot uh, has some magnetization physics in it there, uh, but it's, it's a scalar number, and it's uh, typically less than one, even less than uh, 0.5 um, uh, through, uh, throughout the E region. Uh, a similar instability, arises uh, not necessarily when the electrons are going really fast, uh, but when there's gradient in the direction of the background electric field. And the way this works is that um, you've got the same uh, perturbation set up, uh, but the electric field, that little perturbation electric field, that delta E X there, uh, creates a delta E cross B drift. So again, perpendicular to both this delta E 
and the background mag magnetic field. And as long as this gradient is pointed up, this is important, it can't be pointed down, as long as it's pointed up, that causes these little bits of plasma in the crest, relatively more plasma, to drift down into uh, regions where there is less background plasma, because the gradient is, is pointed upward. So they, this, this clump that's already a little bit higher than background is drifting down to where the background is even lower. So the, um, it, it as a perturbation grows in that sense. Uh, same thing with the troughs. They, it's a little less intuitive, but they drift into regions of relatively higher background, so the deeps get deeper. The lows get lower and the highs get higher. Uh, and that criterion is, is encapsulated then in the, the lower right-hand corner. Um, okay, so uh, naturally, because these pictures are the same, and actually it's mathematically true too, they come from the same dispersion relation, uh, they actually, these instabilities actually talk to each other. Uh, and this was the crux of my uh, dissertation research, uh, where uh, you can get uh, large kilometer scale gradients in the ionosphere, uh, and this actually happens, uh, if you're familiar with that picture that I showed, you may uh, have this this in your mind already, uh, there's a large scale plasma gradient pointed vertically um, at the bottom of the ionosphere before it turns over at the, the ionization peak. Uh, and then there are, if there are farley booneman instabilities uh, happening, uh, this, the, the big scale gradient is driving the gradient drift instability. Uh, it will connect, it will talk to the farley booneman instability. Uh, and we want to understand how that works. Because uh, the aeronomy community still does not have a very good picture of the, the, the power in uh, density perturbations uh, in the range of tens to hundreds of meters. And that is the length scale uh, at which uh, GPS, uh, or that, that affects GPS scintillations. I am not a scintillation expert. Uh, I don't know if anybody else here is. I haven't gotten an indication, so I may be able to get away with some of this stuff, but that, um, the Fresnel zone, the first Fresnel zone, uh, which does the scattering of the signals, uh, is sort of a, a, a few hundred meters. And so we really want to know uh, what's happening, what, what the wave spectrum looks like in that area, and, and we just don't have the information. Uh, we've done some, um, uh, some particle simulations to uh, infer what it looks like at the lower boundary. Uh, we have measurements from uh, at, of single wave numbers, single wavelengths uh, from coherent scatter radars. They, they sense at a single wavelength, and so they can, they can confirm the, you know, three meters or so at uh, 50 megahertz for us, or, or, or a few centimeters. Uh, and, uh, and then we have, uh, we have other me uh, measurements. I don't, I don't do the turbulence modeling or the, um, the observing, um, but we uh, have a fairly good understanding of the spectrum at much, much longer wavelengths. Uh, and so we want to fill in that gap there, and we're going to we're going to do it with simulations, uh, we hope. So, um, so some, some background, the, the previous work, this is work that my uh, advisor did, actually started in his dissertation and then picked it up later. Uh, uh, he, Mears Oppenheim, uh, and then uh, Jakob Diemont, who is um, uh, a uh, the mathematical uh, plasma physicist uh, at Boston University, uh, they've spent a lot of time developing and uh, understanding the results from a... Um, uh, particle and cell simulation that they call EPIC, the electrostatic parallel particle and cell simulation. Uh, and uh, this is a, th these are some figures from the, um, the first results they published of when they finally got the, th the full 3D thing working. Uh, and so this is what the farley booneman instability looks like, uh, at least if you trust a computer uh, to tell you what it looks like. The, uh, it, it begins, so this um, panel, the, the square panel uh, on, on the left shows um, these linear waves uh, forming, uh, and they are each about uh, uh, three meters, a few, a few meters uh, in size, and those are the crests and troughs that I showed in my cartoon picture, um, or as, as, as close as, as uh, we're going to get uh, when, you know, fully modeling this uh, instability. Uh, and then, uh, then those start um, uh, feeding into each other, those, those modes couple to each other, that's the middle panel there, uh, and then they all just sort of, the, the linear modes go away, and we, you know, there's just lots of blobs of plasma, uh, and they're all sort of moving up to the right uh, in this panel. Uh, they don't move exactly uh, aligned along the E cross B direction, they, they move slightly off of it. Um, and then in the, if you, if you take a slice along the magnetic field, that's what the long panels are in the bottom, uh, these 
these uh, density irregularities are elongated uh, because mostly because the electrons can move really quickly up and down uh, the magnetic field, and uh, and so they're in, um, it sort of stretches out the instabilities. Uh, it sort of keeps the they, they convey the information up and down really quickly. These are periodic simulations, by the way. Oh, I, I have that on there. Um, and there isn't a large scale gradient, so that has been uh, that was a, uh, a, a simulation challenge that. Um, uh, that they never got to because um, these simulations uh, on the big end are 75 by 75 by 300 meters squared, uh, and so that's just not big enough to capture the kilometer, kilometer scale gradients uh, and, um, uh, and, and run in a, a cosmological time. Uh, so let me tell you, uh, or actually summarize, uh, a bit of the pick cycle, uh, the particle and cell cycle, um, the the talks this morning um, uh, did a great job of uh, covering a lot of this, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to refresh your memory, uh, normalize a little bit, uh, and also point out where I differ, uh, where these, these, our simulations differ. Uh, so we set up the particles, that's the upper left there, um, and we collect them all in, into a charge density. This is um, relevant for the, the slides I just showed, the, um, the fully kinetic um, pick simulation. And then we solve Poisson's equation from that charge density, uh, and then uh, we uh, weight that um, back to, uh, convert that to a force, uh, think about that in terms of force, uh, you know, and, and, um, and then we use that force to move the particles around. Subject to collisions, which is the, the, um, the other term on, in the DVDT uh, equation there. Uh, and then we push, you know, over and over and over. Right. Uh, so that's, that's the standard um, form for, for our um, fully kinetic um, pick codes. But that requires, uh, that, that requires resolving electron dynamical scales, which sometimes you have to do. Uh, and plenty of people are interested in those, uh, those time scales. Uh, and, and even um, uh, one, one of the Petsy pick talks, I can't even find you guys, uh, uh, was talking about um, uh, keeping ions fixed and watching the electrons move around. Great, good. But the farley bunemann instability is an ion scale instability, so we want the ions. Uh, and, uh, and so the way that we get around the constraints that I've listed here in the full pick, which are that we have to resolve the plasma frequency, we have to resolve the Debye length, uh, the, f the former being the, the fundamental frequency of a plasma, the electrons jiggling around um, their neighboring ions, and then the, the um, the latter being the fundamental uh, length, uh, at, that's the length at which electrons shield out the par positive charge from the ions. Um, uh, in order to get around having to resolve those things, we use a hybrid model in which we treat the electrons as a fluid uh, and only have to resolve the, the ion collision frequency, the ion mean free path, uh, which lets us expand a little bit. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, we lose any non-Maxwellian behavior uh, in the electrons. Uh, which we have to accept as an assumption. Uh, so, so that means uh, where we solved uh, Poisson's equation in the kinetic model, uh, it's not useful to us in the, this, uh, this hybrid and uh, what I'm also going to call quasi-neutral model uh, uh, um, of ion instabilities. And uh, because the, the right-hand side there is zero, when you sum up all the, the charges uh, and the, the charge and, and their densities. Um, and so what we do instead is we assume the electrons are an inertialess fluid. Uh, this is not crucial to the hybrid model, but it is part of the, the quasi-neutral component of this. Uh, and that's the equation on the bottom here. And then we solve this for the potential or for the, um, we get the potential gradient uh, on, on one side. Uh, and what we get out of it is this. And so this is the equation that I, banged my head against uh, for my dissertation that led me to Petsy, uh, that, I con that continues to employ me uh, and uh, will be with me uh, until I die and long after. And uh, it consists of the plasma density on the left-hand side uh, and then other terms, including the electric field, some stuff about the um, electron fluid on the right-hand side, uh, as well as the ion flux. In terms of a particle code, uh, we just get that um, by uh, instead of um, collecting uh, particle positions into charge density, uh, we, uh, we weight the particle positions uh, and their velocities the first moment um, of their distribution uh, and, uh, and get the ion flux uh, out of that. 
And, and then we make some assumptions about the electron pressure. We assume it's isothermal for now, and that simplifies that term. Uh, but the magnetization, which uh, shows up in this R tensor here on uh, both sides of the equation, uh, makes that left-hand side tricky. Uh, and this is a place where I would really appreciate anybody's feedback uh, uh, on, on how to solve this type of problem. Because it's definitely not Poisson, uh, and I'm not sure how to, uh, how to equate it to other things like the heat equation, it's the steady state heat equation, or, or I don't know, maybe there's something in material uh, science. But okay, anyway, um, we'll get on to that stuff. Um, so, so what that means uh, in terms of the, the pick cycle that I and others have shown uh, is that, okay, um, I'm taking a long time on, the, on this stuff, uh, is that instead of the Poisson operator down there, we use this quasi-neutral uh, operator and uh, we get the, the density and the flux uh, from, uh, from the ions instead. Um, okay, and so uh, we have to discretize that. This has been challenging to me. There are all these off-diagonal terms that come from the magnetization there, and because the magnetization can be very large, that adds these large terms to the off-diagonal. Um, and this is just my way of looking at the stencil with different magnetizations. Uh, uh, zero, uh, it still has some uh, density variation, but the, that's di di diagonally dominant. Um, with uh, non-zero values of kappa, there are these big parts on the, on the off-diagonals there. I would also like some advice on that if anybody has some thoughts on how to approach this. Um, so, uh, uh, for my dissertation, I did a 2D version of this, uh, and I'm working now on the 3D version. Uh, and this is sort of what we get when we put in a large-scale wave that might, be, that might arise from the gradient drift instability and watch the uh, farley boonham instability develop in the crests and troughs because of that um, electrostatic polarization in both of those. It's a cross-scale problem, which makes it hard to visualize on a slide, um, but, but I, I hope you can get the idea. Uh, and uh, it, it also makes it uh, expensive to run to try to get these little perturbations from a large-scale si uh, simulation. But the uh, physical outcome of this, uh, which is, was very uh, interesting uh, and explains some observations, is that these, uh, th this movement in the crests and troughs actually sort of shorts out or, or reduces that electric field and brings it back near the threshold. So it's, uh, it's a feedback mechanism, uh, which, which makes sense when you get instability, you gotta do something with that energy. Um, so the way EPIC is set up, there's a bunch of this, it, Petsy is sort of, uh, sort of stuffed in there, um, and a bunch of these um, preprocessor directives, like if we have Petsy, do this, if we don't. I, I've seen that in other people's code even these past few days, so I guess it's not so bad, but I don't like it. Um, it's kind of it's kind of ugly, and it uses what looks to me to be a sort of an earlier version. I'm not using DMDAs, uh, or I wasn't back then, uh, and I'm not using the array capabilities, uh, and so uh, so I don't. It's pretty frustrating work to work with. Um, that's all fine. I'm uh, not going to read all these points to you, but what I am going to say is that. Uh, there are some things, which I've listed on the top, which I nominally, ostensibly I could fix. There are some things listed on the bottom that I don't think are, that would take just as much time for me to write a new simulation, including the bottom point, uh, which is my most diplomatic, and that's that there have been multiple development philosophies with limited coordination in EPIC, and uh, I'm sure that at least some of you know what I really mean when I say that. Uh, so, the next step is to re-implement this uh, hybrid model from scratch with DM Swarm um, and uh, a DMDA for the flux and densities and one for the potential, um, and, uh, and then eventually uh, support other electron models and, and ion models. And, um, and so, currently my basic uh, framework is this. Uh, a lot of these, except for KS, yeah, all of these except for KSP create, uh, are my own functions and listening to the um, to Joe's tutorial today, uh, I, I realized that maybe I don't need to write all this stuff on my own. So that's another way that uh, I would like to connect to anybody else who has more experience with the Swarm um, uh, framework. Uh, uh, and uh, and then so so the one uh, last thing um, that I want to add is that. Uh, I am developing this both as the simulation and as a standalone solver because uh, this is an instability model and so the point of this is the instabilities and so we have to let it run for a long time before finding out that the, the solver model that we chose, or the algorithm we chose, isn't useful or helpful. 
so uh, I want to be able to uh, read in density and flux from something I create in Python or from something I get from another uh, PIC simulation uh, where it's all wobbly, there are lots of irregularities and stuff like that, uh, and then I just test solvers uh, and, and see what I get out of it uh, and find a good implementation there. Um, so uh, the collisionality of the ionospheric E region leads to unique plasma instabilities. The Farley-Buneman and gradient drift instabilities couple energy across scales. Um, hybrid PIC simulation allows us to focus on the ion uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, I am uh, very actively working on this new um, PETSI-first uh, implementation of the hybrid model. Um, OK, so thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt. Any questions? Oh, in the back already? Let me head over there. Oh, that, that was really interesting. Uh, so I have two questions. The first is simple. What kind of uh, particle density do you need? Like how many part particles per cell before you can resolve the farley butemann mm. uh, instability? Um, let's see. I mean, we, we tend to use 2 million over, uh, let's, say, let's say 10 per cell. 10 per cell. Yeah. OK, cool. And then. Um, it would be neat, I think, to try to see uh, if you could um, take the, the linear operator and, and uh, get the unstable modes with Slepsy and see if you could relate those unstable modes to oh, the yeah. different instabilities that are interacting. And then you could see, I mean, you said they're coupled, so you could see <coughs> if it changes as you evolve and stuff like that. It's yeah. Because it's just you know linearized about the present state. Um, and that's really easy to do. We have done that in another thing. Uh, uh, once you have the operator, you can just feed it to SLEPC and tell okay. it to look around zero, right, or for the ne most negative ones or, or most positive ones. I mean, yeah. Like that. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Thanks. Cool. I'm sure there will be more chances to scheme out some more ideas before people leave the conference, but let's thank Matt one more time.